Uh, thank you everybody for joining today's Research Days talk. Um, we have a great team today uh, featuring uh, from, from Carl Stodd University, Anna Brunstrom, Mohammed Usman, and Bastoon Ahmed. Um, and joining us as conversation leaders and also um, collaborators in the project are Toke Hoyland Jorgensen and Simone Fairland Ryder, both from Red Hat. Um, so we're excited to see this, um, hear, hear more about their project IDA, a holistic AI driven networking and processing framework for industrial IoT applications. So thank you for joining. Um, I'm gonna turn it to the project team, but just as a reminder, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. There'll be points where the, the team may open up for folks to join and ask directly. Um, but we look forward to hearing this um, presentation today. So thank you. Welcome everybody. <laughs> okay, thank you Jan very much for the introduction. So I'm Anna Brunstrom, I'm a professor here at Cost University working on uh, uh, architecture and protocols. And uh, I will be starting the presentation. So the plan is to first just give you a brief introduction to Cost University and a little bit background on the AIDA project. And then uh, Mohammed will talk more about the distributed observability framework and Bestoon will give you more details on the machine learning pipeline from the project. But uh, just to click, quickly introduce where we are from. So we are from uh, Costa University. This is a mid-sized uh, Swedish university. We have about 19,000 students, uh, 1,500 staff. It's one of the young universities, a uh, full university since 1999, but with a long history of uh, higher education. So we were a university college before and started uh, teacher education in the mid 19th century. So within the university, uh, on the research side, we have uh, two main research areas. So computer science that we represent on the technical side, and then the service research center on the humanities and social sciences side. And uh, computer science then, we are about uh, 60 staff members, uh, uh, members from uh, many different uh, places of the world, very international uh, department, uh, 20 to 25 uh, doctoral students. Uh, we do undergrad education in all areas of computer science, uh, catering to about 800 students. But on the, the research side, we have uh, uh, three uh, very specific profiles. So we have a distributed systems and communications, privacy and security, and software quality. And uh, of course, these profiles are also closely related. So we have a lot of activities that run across the project uh, research groups. And uh, yeah, all these are key technologies for uh, future cyber physical systems. So uh, the IDA project that we are going to uh, present to you today is a collaboration between the, the DISCO group. So Mohammed and I come from DISCO and uh, the squad group. So Bistoon comes from, from squad. So we'll cover both uh, networking distributed systems and software and data quality and machine learning aspects. So uh, with that short introduction, let me move on to give you a, a brief overview of AIDA, where we uh, work to build a holistic AI-driven networking and processing framework for industrial IoT applications. And this is a project funded by Swedish Natural Funds uh, in collaboration with the six industry partners, where Red Hat then is one of our uh, partners in the project. And uh, let me start by giving you a bit of a, of a background for the project. So what we see today in industry, of course, is that we have a lot of automation. We have a lot of uh, robots and uh, in uh, our production lines in the factories, uh, sensors and actuators and a lot of intelligence. But a lot of this is today integrated within the robots. And it's quite inflexible in that sense. And it's also uh, expensive. So. Uh, we are also not fully utilizing all this information that all the sensors collect to fully uh, derive insights and optimize our operations. So, of course, looking towards the future, we would like to improve this situation and move to a, a virtualized and softwareized situation where you can move the logic out to the edge cloud and uh, have the intelligence uh, running in the edge resources on commodity hardware in a much more flexible way. And then, of course, this also will be a, a allow you to a cheaper solution and to reconfigure a factory. You don't have to rewire everything and put a lot of effort. You need to update your, 
your network con configuration in a software defined way and you need to update the intelligence uh, in the network. So this is kind of the industrial trends and, and uh, movements that we are trying to support in this uh, AIDA project. And uh, if you are going to support the data-driven trustworthy industrial IoT applications, well, then there are a number of key things that you have to support. So you need to get the data from the sensor to this new intelligence residing at the edge, and this needs to be fast and under guarantees. You also need to process the data fast and under guarantees as these uh, edge nodes. And you need to make sure that if you now use machine learning algorithms to control your operations, that the data and the decisions, the data used in those algorithms and the decisions made are correct. So from that perspective in IDA, then we work both on the real-time networks, we work on the real-time edge processing, and we work on the machine learning testing and validation. So on the networking side, we want to see how to configure networks to provide these guarantees in a flexible way using software-defined networking methods. Uh, we want to see how to monitor big data processing in the edge infrastructure to ensure that we meet the, the timeliness guarantees and that the edge infrastructure is working well. And we want to verify that the ML processing is uh, correct and optimized. So uh, before uh, Mohammed and Bistoum will get into details, let me first also then introduce the overall architecture that we have. So in the, in the bottom here, of course, we have a number of sensors and actuators. We have a real-time network that connects these sensors and actuators to the edge nodes. And we have a control plane both for the, for the networking and for the edge node. So if we start to untangle this architecture a little bit and see in more details, the real-time network then is a software-defined time-sensitive network where you have the networking elements uh, controlled by a centralized uh, network configuration, the CNC, which takes uh, information about application streams to uh, deploy over a northbound interface from the centered user configuration, the CUC. It then can calculate the configurations of the networks, also making use of an external network optimizer function and pushing these configurations through the southbound interface with netconf young to the the switches in the network. Uh, the edge nodes then is where the intelligence now resides. So this is where the application containers runs. And this is also where we have configuration and monitoring agents for the individual edge nodes. And the edge nodes are controlled by an edge node controller and you also have a centralized monitoring service. And as I said, inside the, the applications is now where the logic resides. So this is where the real-time uh, processing and analytics takes place. Uh, and some of this data may also be offloaded to the cloud for uh, big data analytics and offline machine uh, learning model optimizations. So this is the overall architecture where the pieces of uh, the IDA work uh, fits in. And uh, I just uh, want to give you a few highlights for each of these parts before we dig into some of the details. So some highlights for the time sensitive network control plane. Well, the key thing here then is that this is now software defined and we have worked on implementing uh, this centralized network controller based, based on a microservices based architecture. And this is also all available as uh, open source. So this currently, uh, support receiving information through the northbound interface through one of the configured TSN uh, protocols and on the southbound interface to push the configurations using netconf young. And we have also verified these implementations in some plug fests against other components. This is a standard that is very much under development uh, still. Uh, we also have a monitoring backend for picking up telemetry from the switches and moving these to uh, Kafka streams that can be used for further uh, processing and monitoring. Uh, we have also worked on having support on the end host for configuration of the network cards, extending uh, some of the software packages from Intel, the DATD software package to support additional cards and looking at how you can jointly 
uh, orchestrate both the, the time sensitive networks and the placement of the different application streams. So the reconfiguration and configuration of the network is then a key component where we have also used uh, now this architecture where you have an external optimizer and you can then plug in different algorithms for this optimization. So currently our uh, PhD student working on this topic is working on uh, a reinforcement learning based algorithm uh, for this optimization using also a digital twin based uh, approach where we have a network simulator uh, in the loop to train the reinforcement learning and it can also be used for uh, validation. And we have a few other algorithms implemented as well, uh, including a genetic algorithm that looks at the trade-off between the, the optimal configuration and the cost for actually uh, pushing this configuration to the network and the changes that are needed there. Uh, moving on to the real-time performance monitoring, we have designed the uh, IDA distributed observability framework uh, and have also a complete implementation on this based on various open source uh, tools and metrics. And uh, Mohammed will tell us more about these details uh, as well as the experimentation and analysis of this desk framework that we have carried out. Uh, in addition to the observability framework, we have also looked at the uh, latency monitoring and the latency for the data flows, uh, designing here uh, a tool for passive RTT measurements using eBPF, uh, uh, the ePeeping tool. So this captures the RTT measurements uh, in the TCP data streams, uh, can also apply various filtering and aggregation techniques for increased uh, efficiency and scalability. And we have uh, both had validation and performance evaluations of this uh, part of this code is implemented, integrated in an open source uh, package called LibreQS used by uh, ISPs to manage their network. And we're currently man running there a measurement study at an ISP in the US to uh, both see how network traffic looks and also get uh, uh, enhancements to the tool. So we just have started to analyze about a month worth of data captured there. So this was a, a quick uh, overview of the real-time monitoring. And then for the machine learning pipeline, here it's important to look at how to integrate trustworthy machine learning in production. Uh, other important concepts here uh, is how the data is uh, varying over time, leading to consent drift or machine learning model degra degradation and how you can uh, uh, detect this and handle this. Also integrating quality assurance in the machine learning pipeline, integrating the data quality within the machine learning operations. And also looking at the data centric approach to machine learning where we have uh, developed some techniques for data quality, quality scoring. Uh, together with our uh, industry partner on the energy side, we have also looked at system anomaly detection using historical data to predict when the consumption, energy consumption of the cu customers are deviating from, from normal behavior. And uh, Bistoon will tell you a lot more details about these pieces. Uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, also Documentation and papers coming out of here, uh, just a few of them listed here for reference. Uh, we have the uh, source code, the open source code in our GitHub. Uh, and uh, you can also check the, the web page for the project for more information. So this was a, a quick overview of uh, the scope of IDA and the pieces that we have worked on. Uh, I don't know if we have any more uh, we have any questions before we move into uh, maybe the more interesting part with the more technical details on the observability and the machine learning pipeline. I don't see anything in the chat. So uh, then I think we can always also come back to questions on everything at the end of the presentation, of course. So uh, then I will uh, move on and leave the word to uh, Mohammed. Yeah, uh, thanks, Anna. So for uh, next around 15 to 20 minutes now, you will be hearing more about this distributed observability framework, which we have been working on. I'm Mohammed Usman, and I'm working as an associate senior lecturer with the Castle University. So uh, Anna just shown this slide uh, previously. 
but uh, I think we will go a bit more into the details, especially from the aspect of like these edge nodes controller and these edge nodes, like how they are kind of designed and how what sort of tools and the platforms are used to characterize these nodes using the software capabilities. So yeah, uh, for the uh, case of IDA, uh, we believe that the containerization technologies are one of the most feasible solution because often they are light fit and the portability of the developed applications are much easier uh, using the containers. And uh, also when we were designing this uh, edge computing uh, platform for uh, IDA, so one of the uh, fundamental assumptions was like, it should be the open source tools which should be used and they should be like following the industry standards and they should be also easy to scale. For example, if you want to add more nodes to the existing cluster, so it should allow the vertical or horizontal scalability in that sense. And the provisioning should be easier when, whenever we are dealing with these tools. So based on these assumptions, so all these edge nodes are being like characterized by two things. One is the hardware and the other one is the software. And for the hardware part, we mostly have the standard hardwares there, but there could be some specific uh, kind of hardware such as GPU or TSN cards. And then we have the software, which is like the main driving force for the whole uh, framework. And for the software part, we use the Ubuntu operating system mainly there. And then we uh, used for the container orchestration, we mainly relied on the Kubernetes and container runtime we use is the container D, which is, by def uh, which is the default with the Kubernetes. And for uh, like the container networking, we have used the uh, Cilium and Cilium offers very like the uh, performance as well as the nice observability uh, for these like the ongoing traffic between the containers. And then for like the uh, applications isolation from each other, for example, we are, we are talking about the different sort of industrial application being deployed onto, into the same infrastructure. So for that reason, we use the concept of the namespaces there. And also for deploying our monitoring and the configuration agents, we use the separate namespace. And for the provisioning for this whole infrastructure, as well as deploying the applications, we mainly rely on the Ansible uh, automation and the deployment. So yeah, that, that was like the main uh, or the key uh, frameworks and their tools which we use from the open source. And then I also highlighted this ePping here because uh, in some of the previous talks, uh, some some of you might have heard about this ePping tool, which is like a network latency monitoring tool developed by one of our uh, colleagues here in Caster. And this is pretty much on card. Like we want to integrate and uh, this uh, ePping tool into the our observability framework. So uh, moving forward, like we have seen like how our edge compute platform looks like. So now we have to see what could be the challenges when we want to monitor such kind of distributed environment. So overall, like um, I just characterized by using like the main, uh, like the areas which would be like the IT system, which is like more distributed now. We have more and diverse edge nodes that we can have in the cluster. We have the platform which run on top of this IT system. And this platform is not a single system, rather it is composed of multiple projects itself. Then we have the applications and applications are no, lo uh, no longer monolithic application, rather they are like the based on the microservices and then these microservices have multiple interconnections with each other. And we have more diverse use cases which are expected to be deployed over these IT systems and the platforms. So this is the overall the landscape where we have to do the all the job of monitoring. Yeah, so when we were going through all the literature and looking at the different tools on the monitoring, so we came across the term observability. So then we try to look more deeper into like what is this concept and how it works. So just to summarize and make easy for you to understand, so ob any observability system is the one which can uh, enable you to collect and process three types of the data, which is like mainly matrices, logs, and the traces from the underlying system and the applications. 
and then it can provide you different signals such as the latency, traffic, errors, and the overall system capacity. And uh, I believe we have done a pretty good, good job uh, in this sense. And we have kind of collected all our thoughts and how this observability principle works. And we have published a survey paper. So if you are interested, you can look more into those details by uh, accessing this open source and this open paper. Okay, so uh, moving forward, like we have already discussed about our uh, edge platform, what could be the challenges in monitoring? What is the concept of observability? Then we decided, um, we started to build our real-time observability framework by using these uh, different principles, which I just mentioned. And again, I will just try to relate with the overall IDA architecture and try to map with the, our uh, observability framework, which we call as desk. And we will see like which component fits into which part of the overall architecture. So for the centralized monitoring services, CMS, we have the server side components or services being developed in as a part of the framework. And then we have the CMA configuration and measurement agents. So in the framework, we have this part in the measurement agents where we define what kind of matrices and the data we want to collect. So we will uh, go a bit more deeper into the details about the framework now. And so uh, below you can see like the different data generation sources and how the data is often processed, starting from the IoT devices and going through over different networks being processed and the edge nodes and maybe offloaded to the uh, core cloud. And for the framework, mainly we were uh, focusing on the edge nodes for time being. And the overall framework is divided into the six main kind of uh, stages or steps. First is the measurement services. And measurement services are responsible for gathering the um, different type of uh, monitoring data from the edge nodes. Then we have the delivery services, which are responsible for moving the data from the edge nodes to the centralized uh, services where more uh, sort of advanced analysis and the data preservation is ha happening. Then we have the Fusion Services, which is mainly doing all the analytics stuff and doing some sort of optimization if required. This process data as well as the uh, raw data is stored in the storage services, where we have like the dedicated data stores for different type of, for example, matrices, logs, traces, or insights. Uh, then we have this uh, visualization and notification services, which uh, extract the data from these storage services and present it to the different users or the operator of the different systems and notification services are to uh, notify about certain failures or uh, other problems that could be happening in the system. And finally, we have this uh, provisioning and orchestration P&O services, which are used to deploy the platforms, uh, this uh, observability framework services, as well as for configuring or reconfiguring the deployed microservices in the edge infrastructure. So uh, for now, even though we have focused on the edge nodes for the framework, but the framework is kind of uh, like the generic and it is possible to ingest the data from the different part of the network or the sensors as well. Again, we have uh, some sort of like the output in the form of uh, uh, some conference paper there. If you are interested, you can look into this to have more uh, insights about how things are being done. So. so before you before you go on to implementation, we have a question from Benjamin Branch. Yeah. Who um I guess he is trying to share his video but isn't able to. Um, he wants to know uh, what are the use cases that you forecast for this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, we kind of our initial target was just to do the monitoring. And then the aim was to do the optimization of the deployed microservices. So uh, that was one of the key main key use case when we have this constrained edge environments and the optimization of these deployed services based on this monitoring data is one of the key use case which we consider. Well, and then so uh, we can but but that's the general purpose of anything that's doing monitoring. Mm -hmm. I, I think he means what's the use case in terms of where would you actually be deploying all these services? I'm sorry, Benjamin, I have to interpret your question, but um, mm -hmm. it, there's an awful lot of services and an awful lot of architecture here. 
where do you think that this would be deployed in the future when you're done? Uh, for now, we are also like have some industrial partners with whom we are working, and one of the uh, like most keen one is uh, some 5G uh, test bed providers. So we are having close collaboration with them, and, and they are pretty much interested to deploy this solution, mm -hmm. their architecture. So yeah, this is one of the key pair, I think. And of course, from the from the Ida project, uh, we also have the industrial IoT use case, yeah, right? That I was presenting from the. Uh, from the overview, so there we have uh, have uh, Uddeholm, a steel production company, as one of the partners. They are not fully there yet, I would say, in terms of the digitalization. But I mean, uh, uh, this is also, of course, one of the targeted use cases for for Ida. That once you move your PLC logic to the edge, and then that's where the, the monitoring and this functionality comes in to to. Uh, ensure that those uh, services are working correctly. So are you especially targeting very large scale deployments? Like to, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of endpoints or is it useful for smaller things as well? I think it can be useful for both. I mean, uh, we will see a little bit. You have also looked into initially some of the, the overhead and uh, mm -hmm. one of the comparisons that we have done uh, with our uh, partner that works on the 5G test bed, we have seen, I don't think you have that in this presentation, but there we have seen that uh, the framework that Mohammed has developed is uh, much more lightweight in terms of the CPU overhead as compared to the monitoring they currently have uh, are using so this is also something that we are looking into but that we are not the covering in the presentation today okay thank you for um expanding on that there's also um a request um which may be coming later in the presentation that we get some more details on the the analytics that are actually being done on the optimization services um as you probably know red hat has similar um services that we support. So um, there's a lot of interest in more detail there. If there is either pointers to that or you're going to talk about it more. Yeah, so maybe this also ties into the machine learning pipeline and the work on the analytics there. So for sure, we can come back to that question if, uh, <laughs> yeah, after we have seen seen also those parts. Okay, thank you. So, so there was also a question in the beginning about uh, why you picked was there a question that now? Oh, was that was me. <laughs> Why you picked Ubuntu instead of, oh, I don't know, some other operating system. <laughs> Just have to ask. <laughs> uh, yeah, like as I mentioned in the assumptions, so we are more comfortable with uh, working with the Ubuntu. And uh... Oh, well, we'll have to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I think most of the Linux distribution are almost similar in some sense. So that does not make too much difference. Yeah, I, I think you're right. There was a point in time when people were worried about being able to use, say, Fedora at the edge because it was large, but um, it's since been used in edge implementations successfully. So that's what I was wondering. We'll, we'll help you out with that. Thanks. Okay, yeah, uh, moving forward. So then uh, for the desk implementation, uh, since this is more uh, relying on the containerization technology, so we look mostly into the CNCF hosted projects, um, uh, definitely open source one. So where most of them are for the matrices, uh, a few for the logging and a uh, reasonable number for the tracing uh, projects were there. And then we have selected for measurement services realization, the trally graph for matrices collection, prompt tail for the logs and the open telemetry SDKs for uh, instrumenting the end applications for generating the traces. And then for the delivery service, this is uh, based on pretty much like the standard, which of, uh, most of the people use is Kafka Zookeeper combination, and then open telemetry collector for the traces. And then for the fusion services or some uh, uh, analytics part, we use the Apache Spark there. And for storage services, we have uh, Prometheus uh, backend for the matrices and Loki for the logs and Jaeger for the uh, traces. 
uh, visualization and notification services uh, use Grafana and Prometheus Alert Manager. And provisioning and orchestration services mainly rely on the Ansible and uh, default tool from the Kubernetes that is Kube CTL. And uh, source code is available on the GitHub, as Anna mentioned. I also put the link uh, to the framework there. Okay, so uh, we, I think, uh, spent quite a, a significant time in doing the experimentation with this whole uh, framework and the infrastructure. And to verify the framework integration and the working, so we have set up a small kind of a Kubernetes cluster using four mm -hmm. desktop-based hardware resources. And we have like this master node, uh, respond, uh, like the reflect the edge node controller functionality. Then we have this uh, CMS, which is deployed into one of the worker nodes as a dedicated uh, for this functionality. Then we have this uh, sensing and the actuation uh, kind of like the application, which is deployed into the one of the worker node. And then we have the uh, like the backend services for ingesting the data from these sensing devices in the worker node too. And uh, I think we have used all the latest version of the tools and the frameworks which were available in that, at, at that time. And we have used ThingSport, uh, as IoT platform for creating some sort of uh, workload in the cluster. And also we have developed some uh, custom tool for like the simulating the sensor data pipeline. So uh, first we did quite uh, a lot of experimentation with uh, measuring how much overhead is caused by the uh, measurement agents at the edge node. So here I'm showing the case for the matrices. And to deploy this agent in the edge nodes, we use the daemon set, which ensure like at least one uh, kind of like the port is running per cluster node. And then we uh, kind of experimented with one second, five second, and 10 second uh, measurement intervals, and we collected the number of matrices. To collect these matrices, we have like different input plugins which target the different part of the like the whole system. For example, to uh, it covers the resources like the uh, the system itself, then the containers and the container orchestration platform. And then these collected matrices are moved to the central kind of services by using some sort of output plugins. And to configure these uh, agents, like we use the YAML configuration, which is uh, pretty much in a case with the Kubernetes uh, objects deployments. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we try to set different resource limits and requests uh, for these agents and try to see what, uh, what is the uh, good kind of configuration. And uh, these are some of the results. Uh, actually, it might, like they, I have created them in some different tool, but that these are coming from the actual data which we have ingested through our, like the agents and then stored into the Prometheus database. And in the uh, top, like the charts, you can see the memory usage and then below ones are the CPU. And then we have like the measurement intervals of one second, five second and 10 second. For the me uh, memory usage, we do not see like the significant difference there. So almost 90 megabyte of memory is used uh, for each edge node. And then uh, in the CPU, we have more kind of like the significant difference where we touch 60 millisecond. So overall for our like the uh, hardware based setup, so this resource overhead was less than 1%. So uh, I think we, we think like this was like quite reasonable in that sense. Okay, so next is the case for like, can we detect some faults based on this uh, measured data? So to do so, we have developed some like an end-to-end -end system and that is used to generate a continuous stream of simulated sensor data. So this, uh, like the figure sure is almost similar to what we have been showing you in the overall ar architecture. So we have the operation technology, uh, like the domain where we have these sources. This source could be like some sensors and then destination could be some actuator, but this is now in just some software which would be doing the same functionality. And then in the IT domain, we have like the data which is being generated from the source is sent to this real-time messaging queue. Then we have some event processing uh, platform which is subscribed to those messaging queues. Then we have some real-time analysis application which consume the data from this event processing platform and publish the data to the messaging queue. Uh, 
where some action need to be taken by the destination and also the data is stored to some of the backend storage. And for this sensor, we have defined like three, three types of sensor. One is normal, abnormal, and the mixed. And for the normal case, like we can have valid data and the transmission could be regular. So that means like, for example, if every second we have sending some message, then for the abnormal case, we have the valid data, but irregular transmission of the data from the sensor. And then for the mixed case, we have both valid and invalid data and data is sent at the irregular intervals. So we deploy this uh, uh, like this application into the our setup. And then we try to look like at the logs and the matrices data and see if we can detect any force just by looking at the uh, at the like the normal sensors and abnormal sensors. So uh, the upper graphs are for the logs. So you can see like the normal port have different kind of number of logs which are being generated from the abnormal ports as well as the mixed ports. And similar is the case for the CPU usage for normal port, which has different profile from the abnormal and the mixed ports. So yeah, these two also like show the uh, successful integration of this data coming from all these edge nodes until the backend, which are uh, being used for the storage of these like the logs and the uh, matrices, as well as show some sort of fault detection could be performed if you have some profile being established for these applications. Okay. Uh, yeah, the next case is also like targeting this uh, real-time uh, analyzer application. So we have uh, enabled the distributed tracing for this uh, particular application. And in this uh, application, the uh, we have some logs coming in to the system and for this particular instance so we have a, an error log for example where we say if the processing time for any particular message is greater than 20 milliseconds then this is considered as an error and then we have an incorporated trace id for this for this particular message and then if we further like explore uh, take this trace id and look at the trace and see where the most of the time is being taken while this uh, request is being processed. So then we can see like, for example, in this case, this storage uh, service is taking most of the time and mainly causing the service violation. So then like based on this information, further troubleshooting can be made for this storage and related services. So yeah, these were some of the, some of the like semi-automated kind of uh, fault detection cases, which we tried. And then this is uh, my last slide. So previous two cases uh, kind of looked at the data analysis at the centralized, centralized monitoring and server. Now this is the case where we can do some sort of fault detection and recovery using the metrics right at the edge node. And to do so, we kind of uh, added some small uh, analyzers, which are kind of uh, integrated with these uh, measurement agents. And what we really try to do is like, we try to detect some crashed applications inside these containers. So there are some cases where Kubernetes kind of ref, kind of report like some container is working fine, but actually container has some sort of exception in not performing its job. So to kind of show what I, I really want to say is like, if you look at this upper graph, so this is running without any fault detection or recovery. And all these, uh, these are for example, different applications but these are these are like the similar application but running several instances so for example is for this uh, blue case like this is a one port so this have some memory usage which is almost close to zero but all other ports have some sort of memory footprint so if uh, so so in default case like this fault is not detected by the kubernetes but when we have this, uh, like this fault detection and recovery process running along with our agent, so then we can kind of detect this fault as well as we can initiate some recovery process at, at these edge nodes. So uh, I think that was uh, pretty much which I wanted to share with you guys. And I tried to show how we can kind of measure the data from these edge nodes and try to do some sort of analysis and move it to the and preserve the data and show some sort of outputs. So thank you uh, for listening. And before I think we move forward, if we have some questions. So yeah, there was it. a question here from how 
about the assumptions and if you could detect some some errors uh, maybe the the remaining slides uh, answer this question already because it came a little bit earlier Are there more questions before we move on to? Tao, did you want to join because you're you're sharing your blank video? Did you want to expand on that question at all? So I noticed it came before Mona talked about some of yes. the yes. I uh yeah because the uh, question was uh, actually uh, at the early part of presentation I see the overall architecture I see the six categories of component and uh, each one has a well defined uh, responsibility boundary and with each component there are also sub component uh, one thing from architecture perspective I just uh, want to know uh, is this is uh, a, a more of a logical level design, uh, and uh, uh, if this component had uh, interdependency to uh, make the work properly, if one of the component got into a failure state, will the whole application stop working? Uh, yeah. Well, basically, yeah. If just want to know the right situation is some simple uh, uh, device probably okay because I have limited resource and uh, I have this uh, design that does not have resident uh, support that is okay I just want to know assumption so no again relate to the use case what is right right use case situation to use that application uh, I have four uh, the case of dependencies uh, one good thing is like since this is based on all the Kubernetes principles, so we have this idea of like the uh, high availability for these uh, components. So all these components could be have different multiple replicas which are running in the cluster at the same time. Yeah. So in that case, it offers you reliability here. So even though you have designed for high availability, if you have a component failure or a service failure, yeah. the question is, do you restart those? Um, or do you have redundancy built in up front so that you don't have to restart? Uh, we don't have to restart. Like the orchestrator should automatically restart the failing uh, container, for example. So if we have three replicas, if one is failing, then we will have two available and the container orchestrator will keep on trying to recreate the failing container in that case. Yeah, I think so far we have not looked into anything yeah. beyond uh, what is provided there by the mm -hmm. underlying framework. Right? Yeah. Okay. It's uh, more of uh, introducing the concept itself, right? Yeah, introducing concept and trying uh, with some small deployment. For example, in our test bed case, which I showed, we had like four a kind of a machines where we kind of experimented with the setup, but we have not really looked with the large scale deployment and try to look how different failures can impact the different services. So, so the assumption is uh, Anna mentioned is like some like the functionalities which are provided by the base framework such as Kubernetes. We try to rely on those for now. Um, another question is uh, um, because. Uh, Edge right now it is such a hot topic. There are so many uh, architecture design on the market, and uh, everyone just to try to share. Okay, here is a way to solve the problem. Uh, I'm, yeah, I can understand that your architecture have this uh, different function modules, um, but I I joined a little bit late, uh, so uh, don't know if I missed that part. Did you explain? What uh, what a unique problem you see that uh, the other architecture are missing? They are not covering that, and uh, so um, you want to address it, and uh, or uh, you're taking approach which is different than others, and that makes your approach is uh, 
more uh, a better better option basically what is the advantage of this architecture uh, i can just comment in one aspect like one of the key goal was looking for this real-time systems here in this our case where we were really looking at this dsm things and having some kind of real-time edge that could guarantee these real-time constraints this was one of the key area which we wanted to explore and yeah, maybe uh, other skin areas as well to this yeah i think we also have um as Marvin mentioned, we have a, a a paper on the on the desk framework that also position. I mean, describes a bit the related work and how the different uh, pieces uh, compare and what mm -hmm. comes from. Yeah, what is available in other other frameworks and uh, I think both of those and also the survey of different observability the frameworks. I think both of those uh, publications also provide. Uh, more, more details on the different uh, choices and the different available architectures. Um, I, I have a comment. Um, my, my, my question is, first of all, I think y'all did an awesome job with, with your effort and, uh, and you know, it's, it's a, an amazing um, work. Um, to be theoretical, um, what would you say would be some of the major aspects of training if so, if industry comes along and says, hey, we want this framework, how would you train this? What would be your major, major training milestones to make this sustainable in industry? What are the main, so your question I think is what are the main difficulties if you would like to deploy this as an as a industry? Just uh, project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, if you're talking about the whole framework or just for my uh, observability framework, uh, this is a bit I'm confused. So you are talking I think about- for the observability framework at this, uh, mm -hmm. this point. Uh, or the, uh, I don't see too many difficulties, especially for observability framework now. So this is more about the software related stuff. But if you were asking about the whole framework, uh, I could see a lot of difficulties there because then we had more components involved, more different like the hardware, software technologies. But from the framework perspective, I still think this is a bit simpler than the whole architecture. Okay, I, I guess I was looking for what type of skill sets would uh, your future works future workforce need? Would they need Kubernetes? Would they need ML? At, at what ratio would you put that? Um, would observability be your your main um, your your main milestone or in, in in theory? So I mean. Uh... From, from the project perspective, we're trying to cover these different components that are required, right? And I think this is, of course, not one person in a company that would manage all of these things. So you would have someone that is responsible for, for managing, setting up the, up the network. You would have uh, people responsible for the edge deployments, and you would probably have like data analysts that also work with some of the uh, ML pipelines uh, and those parts. So I, I don't think it's, uh, of course, to, to build this entire system or to, you know, <laughs> um, make this transition for, for industry, it's not something that one person covers all the, all the pieces. And this is also one of the interesting parts, I think, that for us in the project to uh, also see how we can connect these pieces and where, uh, uh, yeah, the many different aspects that come into play. So we are now presenting some some portions of, of the work, but uh, of course there's still more uh, work needed if you should connect all the pieces and mm -hmm. have it uh, operational in, in industry. But maybe we will also see this a little bit more if we, when we have uh, heard about the ML pipelines, we can also uh, see maybe a little bit because the pieces here are, are closely connected, of course. 
So the ML pipelines can work both on the application data or on the monitoring data for the edge uh, cluster. I think we will hear in Bestoon, we have started with application data, but the similar principles could also be applied to the monitoring uh, data that this desk uh, framework collects. So maybe we should hear the, the mm -hmm. ML pipelines and then we yep. can take yep. more questions. Okay, thank you, Anna. My name is Bestun. I'm a professor here at Karlstad University. Um, we are working mainly on the machine learning pipeline, focusing on the use cases and uh, later on on the monitoring. But uh, what we are trying to do is that to find use cases in the industry that uh, has uh, kind of customizable uh, features that cannot be applied in the classical machine learning pipeline. So uh, um, a bit of, uh, of the background, uh, and then we can go through uh, a few use cases that we had in real use cases. So uh, uh, we focus here on the machine learning in production. Uh, we don't deal uh, so much on the development part, but we, we, we deal more on the operational part. And uh, in, in order to do that, uh, we focus on uh, several things around automation. And um, in automation, uh, we focus on the model of the machine learning, but also we focus on the data. And in the literature, you can see there are a lot of terms, but uh, what we found that best um, describe everything is that we have the ML ops that is a hot topic nowadays, uh, which is an alternative of DevOps, but uh, for, for machine learning, but also we have data ops and model ops, data ops that deal with the data specifically in the operation, but also we have the model ops that deal with the models. So we have this concept drift and uh, auto ML and generalizability and a lot of problems, but our focus is, is mainly on the automation, how to automate these things. Uh, so as you see that uh, in the modern uh, machine learning systems is not like the classical machine learning system that uh, getting a, a file with a bunch of data and um, do some training and, and so on. But now in the industry, it's more like putting it in production. Putting it in production means that continuous everything, which is continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous training, and also continuous monitoring. And uh, um, that is said, it, it is like the DevOps, the classical DevOps. That's why we focus on the machine learning from the software engineering uh, background. And the, we try to apply the software engineering concepts here for the, for the machine learning. But um, 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 we, we focus on the deployment on, uh, of AI in general, let's say, and the machine learning in, at scale, which means like uh, automating everything and uh, trying to, to cope with this retraining and, and uh, uh, a lot of manual things. Um, so uh, there are several challenges there. We have the data quality and we have the model performance. Um, model performance is degrading in the industry when the data is changing. Um, you, when you have a huge amount of, uh, of data, how you identify the quality of this data and then um, what is the uh, the compatibility of, um, of, um, of new algorithms when it comes to that. Uh, maintaining and updating the machine learning is also something very useful for us and how to do this everything in, in the architecture uh, way. So uh, as you know that we have um, uh, MLOps levels, we have level 0, 1 and 2 and then the level 0 is, um, uh, is the manual process which is not automated but uh, the level 1 is uh, automation and the continuous integration, continuous delivery. 
So the, with the architecture, why, why we propose this architecture? Well, there are several architectures, as, as uh, one of the questions said, um, even for the machine learning, is uh, the, there is this uh, famous Google's reference architecture. However, the, the, the problem is these are quite general architectures. And when you, you go into detail, you cannot find details. And uh, what we focus on is that what if we want to have several components in this architecture that integrate it? And then, for example, what is, the, what, what is needed for the continuous testing for machine learning? And then if that is the case, can we use that for the use case and also for the monitoring part? Because you get a lot of monitoring data, then you need to implement some machine learning, like, for example, some anomaly detection for the monitoring data but also for anomaly detection for the uh, for the industry for example for the use cases so that's why we we need different components in this machine le in in this uh, architecture nothing is wrong with the google reference architecture of course and the other architectures but what we focus on is details in the architecture that we want to to know and then um the the life cycle as you know that um, of the ML ops is like the design and development and deployment, but we focus more on the deployment. Although we do several uh, things in the design, but um, we focus more on the deployment. Um, um, we also focus on uh, development to deploy, and then uh, we, it means that um, if we do the testing during the deployment, how we automate this to be continuous testing during the deployment. If you do it in the, in the development, then how to do it continuously in the, in the, in the deployment uh, when you deploy the, the, uh, uh, the model. And uh, that's uh, also correct for the, uh, uh, the, the production environment when you have uh, in, in real time, how, how, how to do this when, when you develop, how to consider the real time uh, production environment. Um, and then we need to move the model into the production environment and how to do this. Uh, and then um, the continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery, that is also our focus. And then um, uh, the, a, a main part of the of the architecture and the of the work of the components that we we try to to integrate into this architecture is the uh, data centric problems that we want to to focus on, which is like the data quality and also imagine that you have the the classical way that you have the the the, the data source and then you you have condition A or uh, some, some condition applied to this data, and then you collect this data, you do the machine learning modeling, and you have some something like prediction, whatever, uh, classification, and then after some time, there is this condition is changing, then the data is changing, then the machine learning is basically degrading, and it's not representing the, the current data. So how to do this, how to do, to do this uh, detection um, in the literature, there are a lot of um, a lot of things, uh, but um, mainly we are focusing on the degradation. So, for example, in industry, you have a classical way of classical problem of reducing operational cost, and then you reduce the machinery, but then you reduce the data, or the data is changing. Then you have the same machine learning model, but there is a drift. And then when there's a drift, it is time to retrain. So in the, in the architecture that we, we uh, focus on is, is like we, we need to, to have the, the data augmentation, for example. And then you have the model testing and you have several components, for example. And um, uh, in order to do this, um, we need customizable, um, let's say, uh, services and we need uh, we we developed several services that we have for uh, anomaly detection and for data augmentation for testing 
and uh, we containerize uh, these things. We try to to make it general by um, by having a configuration file. So you define the configuration, you define the data scales and everything in the configuration file. Then the um, the, the service, let's say the container, will will uh, operate as it is. So you don't need to change the code, but you just just change several uh, a few properties in the in the in the configuration file. So this is um, one use case that we applied in the industry that uh, and and still uh, there are several use uh, several components that uh, we need to to finish there. It's like. Um, you have a real world application. Let's say we, we are working a lot with the steel production and the, then um, you, you have the model ops and you have the data ops and you have the automation management. And the, during this time you have like um, robust data cleaning. Um, and uh, uh, um, I mean uh, the the anomalies um, and then uh, uh, s several other things and then how to do this in the in the um, in the in the production. One of the use cases that we had is like the the machine learning um, that is used for predictive maintenance, in which you have, for example, um, a, a furnace that deal with uh, with some. Uh, with, with melting of steel and then uh, you have data and then there is a predictive maintenance in which you need to know whether you want to to shut down the furnace or to keep the furnace uh, working until they finish the the maintenance and then based on the the data that we get for example you need to know that how much how how long the time is for the maintenance. If the maintenance is, is long enough, then it's it's worthy to, it's more feasible to shut down the furnace. Otherwise, it's, it's to, to keep the furnace uh, working. So, um, um, so th there is this, this pressure uh, prediction also that we have, um, uh, so th that is the, the the case, and then, uh, for example, also the the early identification of the invalid uh, uh, pump events. Um, so this is a, a very uh, well known uh, use case, and then another use case that we had is that um, the drift handling um, of of this. For example, if you have a furnace A, and then you have uh, for example, um, let's say that you have furnace A and then it's working with some data and then there's a, a now you want to add the furnace B and then it's, it has a slightly change of data because of the, of the uh, property change of the furnace B, although they look similar, but the, the data that you get is not, is not the same. So how you do this adaptation during the during the, the production without stopping the production, then you, you, uh, you put another machine learning. So the, the machine learning will adapt with this, this kind of drift. And then uh, you have the, 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 mo the, the model, let's say. Um, another um, use case that we had is the, the data quality. And this is very important. For example, when you, you want to to store the data. And um, when you store the data, uh, and then there are a lot of, for example, maintenance. So it's not, it's not worthy to, to store this data at, at, at the first. So it is better to, to know which kind of data you are storing also, and uh, which kind of quality you have. So for example, if you have several sensors in the, in the industry, that is um, several sensors that failing, it means that this data has low quality than other data that has all the sensors working. So what we implemented with the help of the expert uh, people in the industry is that we identified several 
um, several data quality dimensions, and then we trade some algorithm, and this algorithm is, is um, we put this algorithm into production, and every time you store a, a window of data, a data window, let's say, um, you have uh, some scoring, but also we keep a machine learning model um, watching the data, and then if this is scoring is, is uh, not working very well, then uh, we retrain the model and we, we make everything, this is scoring um, automated. So this is also something that we, we do, and then um, uh, the, the scoring can be changed easily in the configuration file. So if you identify which kind of data you have and you have the, the uh, dimension of the data, so you can also uh, modify this, this, uh, this file, this configuration file. Another thing that uh, we had with the predictive maintenance, for example, is that always uh, the, the the failure of the pumps, for example, is is not that frequently working. So what we do is that, for example, if you have a few samples of data, then how to, for example, when you want to make a decision and you have a few sample of data, then how to automatically do some data augmentation and uh, to, to make a, a robust decision based on this. And um, this automated data augmentation that we implemented is like you have, a, you have several, uh, let's say, condition in the, uh, in, in the furnace, and then you have some historical data, but this historical data is, is um, not enough let's say it's, uh, then we increase the we increase the data points by some uh, physical uh, let's say equations of the of how the data is distributed and also by some well known algorithms for the data augmentation and then during that when you want to make a decision a few seconds after, before that you make some data augmentation and then uh, you make a, a better decision based on that, let's say a more reliable decision. Uh, another use case that we worked on is the uh, detecting failures uh, or, uh, or predicting faults in the electricity grid uh, that uh, we, we had um, here in Karlstad, for example. And then when you have a historical data and uh, you have, um, a lot of data by the, the customers. Um, so we, we um, simulate the, the whole topology and then we, uh, based on the data drift that um, we had, we, we can identify, for example, which, uh, which uh, node in the grid is going to fail based on the, on the load on that node. So, um, based on the historical data and the, the data that we have continuously each, each timestamp uh, currently is like each, uh, each uh, 10 seconds or each, each, uh, each minute actually, uh, you can monitor, for example, the, the data and you run, a service will be run and then um, 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 if the, for example, if some substation is is reaching, for example, let's say uh, sixty percent or ninety percent of the load, it means that there is there is some failure in that substation, or there could be some failure in that substation in the future. So we we focus on that. Uh, finally, what is next? Um, uh, we we are looking at the cloud services that's coming on uh, nowadays, and we implement these things in the edge. But we we also look at the uh, the commercial, let's say, cloud services like Azure and and so on to see what is uh, what is missing uh, and how to to implement these things. Um, um, another thing that we looked at uh, in the use case, we don't have time here, is that for the industry, for example, how to put, how to do this drifting and then how to, uh, when is the time to, um, 
uh, when is the time to retrain the model and when is the time to put another model in production without um, seamlessly and without uh, cutting the production. And then um, another thing we, we looked at uh, nowadays and uh, we will be looking at uh, more is the mutation testing in which how to do the mutation testing online and um, um, yeah, uh, an anomaly detection. We had uh, several anomaly detection services that we did for the industry and uh, how to, and we, we, we have, uh, for example, containerized services for this, uh, for the anomaly detection for the customers, for example, with the electricity grid. And then, for example, one customer, you have the, the historical data for like three, four years of the customer. And then if there is some shift in the data happening for two, three days, then it means something wrong with this, this household or uh, uh, then maybe calling uh, the household or um, sending some technical uh, team to the household to, to see what's going on with the with the with the house so um, yeah um, there are several use cases that uh, that is useful for this ml pipeline let's say uh, for uh, uh, for industrial partners and also for municipality that we applied um, yeah thank you that was my last slide okay with any question i mean Thank you, Bistu. So let's see if we have uh, questions. Um, I, I have a question. Um, in your in your prediction, at what point do you make the distinction or or determine whether your your data that's coming in needs to be real time, real time at at what interval or or, or non real time, and how important is that to your prediction? Well, uh, for the real time now, uh, what what we had is like three. Uh, currently, we had three seconds for the real time in the in the industry. But um, how to identify the real time? It depends on the on the use case actually. But uh, if I if I understand your question. Um, you mean, for example, how you identify that it is time to to retrain? Do you mean this, or uh, not only that, but the 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 cost of capturing that much data and and whether or not it's useful? Yes, that's why we have the data quality uh, scoring because um, we we identify several thresholds. For example, if you have a data, but that is depend on the use case actually. But uh, what we did is that here, for example, um, what we did is that we put this configuration file. For example, if you have a data window and you have the data window is, let's say uh, 80 points of data, then um, if, let's say 20 points are missing in this data. So it means that this data, this, the, date, the quality of this data window is, is very low. So why should I store it? Or if I store it, I store it in a, in, with a dimension of the data to identify. Later on, for example, if you want to retrain your model or you want to use, it is better to, for example, to take a bunch of the, of the good quality data to train, but also maybe you want to, to take a, a distribution of this data quality dimensions. Uh, so yeah, that is the, the case. So you don't want to, to store every data just randomly. So we want to store the data with data quality dimension. Um. One question, uh, are these uh, slides uh, available from the website? Uh, we can make it available. Yeah, I think uh, they will also be shared afterwards. Yes. I mean, they are not on the on the website right now, I think, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely share them. Okay. 
Great. Do we have also open source, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not open source, but we have also a GitHub repository that uh, we have the code there, but also we have the, uh, the publication. Um, all the things we present here are available in the publication also, most of them maybe, yeah. Okay, yeah, and uh, um, I like uh, uh, the content pretend, uh, present like uh, on this, this uh, slide on the screen, this is good because there are so many uh, architecture try to solve this overall edge AI problem. And uh, this one present very clearly that uh, you want to uh, introduce a concept that a data source has credibility or reputation, and uh, you want to take that into consideration. You have proposed a way to solve this. And this will help, at least has for me to know, okay, yeah, this is one of the the differentiator from the other one that start to pay attention to, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the, I, I don't know if, uh, yeah. I, anyway, I will read the, the material if since it will be available uh, offline. And uh, yeah, I mean, just understand the the, the, the news, the difference uh, of your presentation from the, the the rest. If you if you search for this red. Um title here uh, on internet it's available uh, online so uh, that's the data the the paper uh, we call it dq apps uh, dqs ops uh, let's say mm -hmm. uh, data quality scoring operations yeah uh, this is our strategy yeah yeah this data the actually this this particular one is uh, is already a, a very common uh, use case in the financial fraud detection scenario uh, with everything go online, uh, then uh, there are all kinds of uh, companies uh, providing the fraud detection specific uh, situation like I can use a voice, I can use a read the browser uh, footprint, uh, the fingerprint, uh, I can use the keystroke. They all come in and said, okay, here's my assessment or judgment. Then the, the bank using all this technology coming in, aggregate them, to create an overall assessment score. But uh, before they validate this, they have no idea that because the fraud it only you can only validate the way it happens. So before that validation, everyone said I'm perfect, right? And so there should have an automated way in the AI coming in to look at the final result, look at the prediction, and then automatically adjust the rating, waiting for each data source. Okay, you are more trustful or you're not, and that may change over time. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, a, a, yeah, a bank scenario relate to this diagram. Sometimes it's not really a data quality things, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a, the technology of that data source is, a, yeah. It's biased. Exactly. Yeah, I see there is a question. Deep, uh, bust, bust down, is that how you say your name? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I put a couple questions in the q and I don't know if you saw them or not, but um, I had some questions about uh, the algorithms for how you're doing the data drift and model drift detection in, yes. in, in how you trigger that retraining through, I think, what is this thing you have there called the method activator? Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit to that, how you, like, are you using out of the box algorithms for those drift detection events and analysis, <laughs> or are you doing your own thing? How, uh, it's, it's a mix, actually. It's a mix. Uh, we use the, the well-known algorithms and then um, uh, but also we, we take the statistical uh, distribution of the data. And uh, also nowadays we, we use some concepts that uh, applied in uh, software testing called test, uh, test Oracle. I'm not sure you are familiar with that, but uh, we, we use that also for the drift detection. And uh, so, for example, it's, it's kind of trigger that we, we put, uh, if you look at the, um, the reference architecture of Google, uh, the general reference architecture of Google, they have this trigger, but now we, we 
convert this trigger or we, we say that it is a test oracle basically and the test oracle uh, compare the, 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 the historical distribution of the data with the, with the current data window and uh, for, for some timestamp and uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the reference to the, um, to the, um, the machine learning that in place now and then decide that it is time to, there is a deviation uh, in, the, in, the, in the performance. Also, it's, it's, um, it's about you, how you configure the retraining. For example, some people may see that um, losing a, a few percentage of the accuracy, let's say, is not, not that, that bad that uh, you need to retrain the whole model and that may, may cost you a lot if, if you put it in the, in the cloud. And if you train in the cloud, then the computation, it costs you a lot then. Uh, but at some point, the, there is degradation, of course, and at some point you have to configure and you, you decide that at this point I have to retrain. There is no other way. Also, there are a lot of research, not a lot, but there is also a research direction also uh, how to retrain. Uh, is it like a fully retrain or partial retrain? And th there are papers about that, but for the details of how we detect um, the drift and the algorithms we used. Uh, uh, there are our papers, we put it there and, and you can see the algorithm details, uh, how we detect the, the drifts. But also we have a very famous now um, um, survey paper, let's say, about all the drift detection methods and it's getting a lot of attention. So. Uh, because there are a lot of mixing uh, vocabularies about the drift detection, but uh, we, we try to formalize everything in one, one well-known paper now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And sorry, one more, one more quick question. On your grid use case, were you actually talking to, you know, doing this in a substation? And if so, were you doing, were you integrating at like the goose protocol level? To get the data off of the um, off of the you know the, the substation. Yeah, uh, currently we we get the data um, not manually, but um, uh, let's say um, in a in a manual way of of like the they they get the data every one hour, but um, we didn't put this in production actually. But we, we get like hourly data and we have historical data for three years. And then by hourly data, we identify that. But because the municipality needs to, to have a, a, a grid infrastructure, not a grid, but a, a cloud infrastructure that manage this grid and it's not in place now. But what we did is that uh, we have the historical data for three years and we take hourly data. Is is that like a traditional fetch it, fetch it out, fetch it out from the? I mean, yeah, the traditional way. Is it so? Like a, you're just hooking up to like their SCADA historian kind of thing? I think so. I think so. I I, I really don't know how they get the data, but uh, we get the data from from them. Okay, so yeah, so they're yeah, we're we're looking at. And you know, I can follow up with you on this, but you know, doing DER ADMS integration at the Goose protocol levels to do you know real time failover or virtual protection yes. relay type use cases, which means you're at you know you're on the substation doing more real time, you know sometimes down to three, you know microseconds type of uh, you know interactions. So um, to do uh, you know failover, you know to do uh, like. You know, especially adding all these new renewables to a grid, you need more, you know, more control at the, you know, at the, at the point of the, of the point of the relay. I think the data you have is still maybe at the slightly higher layer, right? Or do you have it on, on uh, We, we on have the it on level? the, on the uh, substations, let's say, but uh... Yeah, it's it's a bit higher level. Yeah, more, a bit more aggregated, I think, mm -hmm. than what you are talking about here, John. But I, mm -hmm. I think the 
the same yeah. principles could uh, probably yeah 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 of course of course yeah. yes yes because we we what we do is that we we build a, a tree every every um, let's say every three seconds and so uh, we build a tree and uh, we we see that it depends on the on the data actually but now we 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 get the data every one hour but uh, every one hour you build a tree and you identify the and we with the visualization you identify which which nodes are uh, about to fail or uh, which nodes are critical and then for example the municipality uh, is able to send the team and say that okay what well, look what's going on in in that area and yeah um, I, I have a, a question just to follow up on that. Um, um, sorry, um, Benjamin, uh, we have two questions in the chat that we kind of like missed, uh, and we are almost on time here. Um, could you give Sean the chance to ask his question about attacking industrial IoT networks? This is, I think, more for, for Mohammed for the previous presentation we had. Um, so he asked basically um, if the monitoring could detect anomalies, uh, anomalous behaviors from nodes under an attack, because an attack is usually on, on industrial IoT, it's usually uh, using an edge node um, and use the communication protocol to pivot into the cloud. So trying to use the edge node as, um, yeah. so I don't think we have that yet, but we talked about um, something along these lines. Yeah, for now, I think we have not really looked into this uh, security aspect. Mm -hmm. We were mainly looking at the fault detection from the legitimate applications which are deployed at the edge, but uh, definitely this is very interesting area to look into and see if we have some different kind of resource profile when we have some attacker or intruder entering into the system and then most probably like with the combination with this our key peeping tool and the uh, collection of matrices from the nodes should be able to let us know if something is happening like anomalous in the system okay yeah um... Sean, you are also uh, welcome to, to contact Mohammed um, offline if you want to ask more about the anomalies that we are thinking about injecting in the system to do the prediction and work more on the analytics. Um, the last question that we have um, today is from Arturo, um, more general um, where and how we used Ansible in the platform. We didn't, but we talked about it, <laughs> I think. Yeah, mainly we used it for the cluster setup. So this is more like infrastructure as a code thing. So when we deployed this Kubernetes cluster, it prepared all the nodes. So just to make this more automated way, so we use Ansible there. Because we have this more experimental setup, which needs redeployments again and again, so we have Ansible there. All right. Um, I think we are on the top of the hour now, exactly one minute before. So maybe, I mean, Benjamin, if you want to ask your question, I interrupted you, then we can conclude perhaps. Oh, oh no problem. My question was um, in, in your continuous um, data quality scoring, what do you do if the system is undergoing maintenance? How do you know that you're collecting the data regularly or the anomaly is just the main routine maintenance? No, you mean the anomaly, we don't take the anomaly here, but uh, the, the quality um, dimension that we have is we don't take the uh, uh, when when the system is under maintenance, they usually shut down the uh, the, the sensors, and the sensors are, uh, I mean, they, they show uh, not available data. So we don't collect this data basically uh, during the maintenance. 
I mean, we collect the data, but this data is going to a bad, bad uh, uh, data quality dimension, actually. So that's one, one of the reasons that uh, during the maintenance, why we collect the data while you shut down the, the sensors. So um, I really want to thank our speakers. This is Heidi, um, Anna, Mohammed, and Bastoon. Um, this is a huge topic, and you did a good job giving a summary of a very large area um, in a short amount of time. So really appreciate that. All the speakers are happy to be contacted directly if you want, or you can reach out to the research group at Red Hat, and we can um, connect you with their work if you're interested in more. Um, and thank you also to Simone and Tetoke for um, being our conversation leaders um, and helping to interpret uh, this project and bring more information about it to everyone. Um, look forward to seeing you again at the next Research Days event. Um, and we will send out a recording link uh, after this to everybody who's attended in case you want to re-listen um, and uh, slides which include links to papers will be on research.redhat.com. Thank you. Thank you so much.